Hello everyone, today is Thursday, June 15, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So thanks. What do we talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions, and there's some interesting developments there, and we're going to flesh that out when we get to the live charts. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, wait until we get to the charts. And this is for your benefit, just so I can make sure I see your questions on an individual stock. Put in a ticker, and again, for your benefit, hit return. That way, I can make sure I cover as many as possible. This week's focus, I'm going to continue to follow up on a TKO, especially since we have a, a backup, uh, backup, a back-to-back -back setup in the NASDAQ and the Qs. And the question is, is it a knockout or is it knocked out? And that'll make more sense. In a minute, we're going to follow up on a live example, which did stop out. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the beauty of the pattern, specifically waiting for entries. And then I want to cover handling a drawdown. We had a string of bad trades recently, and it sucks, to put it mildly. But I want to talk a little bit about that and some of the psychological things that come along with the drawdown. That was a disclaimer screen that just zipped by. You can read it on my website if you like. It has a lot of useful information in it, such as don't take a laxative pill and a sleeping pill on the same night and things like that. And I could usually sum it up pretty quickly, all predictions about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now. And then lately, I have been talking about the beauty of a textbook TKO. And that's when you have a nice wide range bar down in your TKO and the stock closes poorly. Now, I've been covering this quite a bit lately, so I'm going to go through it fairly quickly today and then get to the live examples. So, again, sometimes you have a nice wide range bar lower where you have a poor close. And by poor close, I mean the close is at or near the low for the day. And when that occurs, you can pretty much trade it in a textbook fashion. That's why I call it a textbook TKO. You can put your entry above the high, the stop below the low, and then those calculations give you your risk. And if you add your risk to your entry as the way the money management works, that gets you your initial profit target. Now, obviously, we want to trail a stop and make a lot more than just one for one as I often preach, to beat the potential negative expectancy. And I've done quite a few videos on that. If you dig around my YouTube channel, you could find them. One day I'm going to get better at getting them all organized, and I'm working on all that. And I think as I roll out this learning management system, eventually these type of things will be put into it, hopefully later this year. But anyway, in the meantime, you have to go poke around on videos on my website or on my YouTube channel. Now, this was the example in the queues from uh, last week. And you can see we had a pretty serious knockout type of move. And then it closed poorly, meaning that it closed down towards the low of the bar. Actually, on the low of the bar. Now, again, so the entry would be above the high. Stop would be below the low. And... That's the textbook nature of it. Now, you do want to give it a little bit of wiggle room, but it could be fairly close and traded nearly mechanically. So this is how it played out. We had the poor close. We had the entry triggered a couple days later, or three days later specifically. Stop goes below the low. And, of course, there's your risk. And then add your risk to your entry for your initial profit target, and that was actually hit on a gap. And here's the math on all that. And just to make it simple for illustrative purposes, I put the exact high plus one cent and the exact low plus one cent. Again, you might want to give it a little bit of wiggle room. The beauty is, though, when a market closes so poorly like this down towards the bottom of its range, you can come in fairly close to that high because if that market comes all the way back up and triggers, then you might have a bona fide reversal back into the direction of the longer term trend. Now, let's look at what happened subsequently. There's your entry. There's your stop. 
and the initial profit target again was hit on a gap. And then as I said last week, we trailed the stop higher and you want to be to break even once your position hits the initial profit target. So break even is obviously the same as your entry. So the worst can happen, barring overnight gaps, of course, is that you scratch out on the remainder of the trade. And last week I said, let's play a game. Let's just leave the stop at 139, and which is the same as the entry, thereabouts. And if the market takes off, then we'll slowly tighten that stop over time, slowly trail that stop higher. And let's continue to play this game and see how long we could stay with the position. Unfortunately, we found out really quickly based on the slide we saw a few days ago. I guess that was, was that Monday or Friday? The market began to implode a little bit. And we'll take a look at that when we get to the market in just one second. So, obviously that stopped out. So, game over. Now, here's the question. Do we have a new game now because we have a backup signal? Now, ideally, I like the highs to be below the prior highs on a TKO setup. But I think this one is close enough to call it another TKO. So, if the market triggers by taking out this high then that would be a new setup because the overall longer term trend still looks pretty darn good. So the question is, is the market a knockout or has it been knocked out? And where I'm going with this is sometimes a knockout move is more than just that. Sometimes it can be the start of something much bigger. Right before I got started this morning, or earlier this morning, I should say, someone emailed me and said, uh, what's the difference between a knockout and the beginnings of a first thrust? And I didn't have time to put slides together. If you want answers on stuff, just FYI, uh, Thursdays are usually kind of crazy, so it's hard for me to start from scratch and, and, and put together some stuff if you have a question on a Thursday. So try to get those questions to me a little bit earlier in the future. But the question is, sometimes you have a knockout bar, and how do you know if that's not a first thrust down, which is a bearish pattern, or just a bullish continuation pattern? And the answer is you don't. But what you do is the first on the first bar down, it's a TKO. So you put in an entry above the high and a stop below the low if you're triggered, and you look to play the longer term trend. Now, again, as we'll see in just a few seconds, sometimes that could be the beginning of something like a first thrust. And if it pulls back a little bit, you might actually look to play it as a first thrust. And sometimes the market might rally up a little bit and stall out. Now, this kind of gives you a micro first thrust. So that's a little bit tougher to make the decision on whether or not you should trade it or not. Now, as you've often heard me say, if, if you're in a trading service, with a TKO, I like to see the knockout happen, and within the next couple of days, I like to see the trigger, because if a market just kind of, uh, let's just start over here. Let's see if we can erase all this. Now, again, as I said a second ago, with a knockout type of move, I like to see that trigger fairly soon because that proves the market is is very resilient and bounced right back. If it starts drifting in here, then it starts looking a little bit dubious. Okay, then maybe this is the beginning of something bigger. So to answer your question on whether it's a first thrust or a TKO, it, it depends. We'll have to wait and see what it looks like out here somewhere and then make that determination. But as a general statement with a TKO, you want to see that trigger fairly quickly. If it triggers on the first day after a big day down, you have a big day down, and then this market goes right back up, then I think you really have something here. It makes that 180 type of move back in the direction of the longer term trend. But again, if it begins to meander, then you have to begin to question the setup. I don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily as a blanket statement say, oh, it's time to rush out and short the market. 
but you might have to reevaluate your position, your potential position, as far as going long the market. Now, here's the beauty. Sometimes you get the knockout move, and then all of a sudden the market gets knocked out, really knocked out. And that happens without a trigger. So that's pretty cool. So in order to win, sometimes it helps not to lose to begin with. And as I often preach, no trigger, no trade. So in this particular case, here's your textbook TKO. And you have your buy above the high, and you have your stop if trigger below the low, but notice what happened. The next day, the stock begins to implode, and it gets nowhere near this trigger. So you say, never mind, let's go for the next trade. Now, to those of you who have been following along for a long time, you're probably rolling your eyes and making the dust sound or whatever. <laughs> but you'd be surprised at how many people try to catch that metaphorically falling knife. I don't, I don't remember if I put it in the slides or not, but there's a, I have a slide at least in the trading full circle course where guys literally try to catch the falling knife. So the beauty is if you're not putting capital in the harm's way, that's kind of difficult to quantify because how do you quantify something that's, I guess, hypothetical? You didn't, you didn't actually take the trade. So how do you quantify that? So you can't, but you can quantify it if you do, obviously. And this is really huge for your longer-term success because you have to dig yourself out of the hole you put yourself in. And then, unfortunately, as you know, with drawdowns, you have to make back a lot more than you lose. So waiting for entries will often keep you out of trouble, which is obviously crucial for your longer-term success. So as I just said, assuming that you're following a plan of 2% risk, and you lose on a trade, now you might have to make back 2.04%. Now, that doesn't seem like too much more than 4%, 2%. Okay, that's not that big of a deal. But if you have a couple of these, then it gets much, much bigger. And here's the deal, and this is why I have a little asterisk on it. It's highly unlikely that you're going to stop yourself out at 2% because you've already broken the rule by not following a trading plan to begin with. So psychologically, you can't get a little bit pregnant. Once you start breaking the rules, you'll be more likely to continue to break the rules, thereby creating a downward spiral. So you'll have likely greater than a 2% loss, and then you'll break the rules again and likely have greater than a 2% loss. And then before long, you're in a pretty deep hole that's hard to climb out. Remember that percent to recovery, your, your losses might look like this, but the percent to recovery looks like this. And obviously at 50%, you have to make back 100%. And then I think at 90%, you have to make back like 900% or something like that. Close enough. It doesn't really matter. It's a lot, okay? Now, speaking of drawdowns, we've had a series of bad trades lately. Wait a minute, Dave. You just, you just admitted you had some bad trades? Absolutely. <laughs> you know? Sometimes it happens, spelled with a silent SH, right? Well, I'm getting some questions like, well, Dave, I noticed there was a sell signal here and a sell signal there within the long position, even though it wasn't stopped out, should we have exited? And people are pointing out some other things, such as the longer-term trend in the market has just gone up over the past seven years. And they're correct. But quoting my good friend Greg Morris from Investing with the Trend, he said, the absolute worst time to create or change a rule is when you were emotionally concerned about something that just seems not to be working correctly. And I wrote a column on this a while back. And the example that Greg was using was in the flight simulators, easy for me to say, they would put all these flashes and buzzers and all these lights and things to, to create these issues, or they would create these, these anomalies or issues, whatever you want to call them. And they would try to force the pilot into panicking and breaking the rules or breaking procedure of what should properly be done, what should be done properly, 
thereby crashing in the simulator. Now, I guess it's a lot better to stress a pilot out while he's on land and find out what he's made of before he gets up in that fighter jet and hurts himself or someone else. So you got to be really careful not to change the rules in the middle of the game. And as I often preach, there's always a reason to exit a trade and rarely a reason to stay. Now, this is just one example. And if you guys have come, have attended these uh, weekend charts, you'll see that I often beat the dead money horse quite often. But going back to this CNX trade, notice that when we first got in, we were faced with an immediate loss. Now, that doesn't look like much, but that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It was about nine, it was about two weeks. Okay, it doesn't look like much, but that's about two weeks worth of trading where you're you're at a loss and then throughout the trade there were dead money periods where it just went sideways you had a near bow tie if you squint your eyes it looks like a bow tie sell signal so there's a sell signal but Dave why would you take a sell signal well because you're following your original plan and you're just going to honor your stop and that's all you have to do. I know easier said than done. And it sucks when your stop starts getting hit and you start, it seems like you're getting systematically taken out of every position you get into. It's very hard to keep your head. And, and I'm not immune. I'm, I'm dropping F-bombs over here and then I get emails from people saying, hey, Dave, it sucks. It's like, yeah, it does. You don't have to worry about telling me it sucks because I know it does. But longer term, you have to have a methodology, and longer term, you have to follow it. And getting back to this example, you had nearly a sell signal there, and then you had dead money once again. Dead money means that it's going sideways or maybe even lower, and you're giving up either open profits or you have losses that are either mounting or certainly not improving. And then here you actually had a bona fide sell signal to the downside and then obviously a pretty big slide not looking so hot bad news looming now I'm not sure why I quoted that but if memory serves I'm pretty sure someone emailed me and said they're bailing out because it's not looking so hot so hot and there's some bad news looming now I don't know if they meant the chart suggests because the stock is sold off that there's some bad news coming or they were anticipating bad earnings or something along those lines. And then we had a bow tie sell signal right around the same time. And then the market went back up and made new highs. Now it did stop out eventually as all trades will, but the point is that if you got out every time things look a little iffy, you would never catch a winning trade. Outliers are key, and that's one of the nuances of the methodology that I often talk about. And a lot of times I make it sound too elusive, and sometimes it is quite elusive. You might go months without catching those few big winners that you really need to make it pay off. And that's the really hard part about trend following is to continue to follow the plan. Now, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. And I've been doing some soul searching lately on how do you get over that because you are doing the same thing over and over by trading these particular patterns in these particular stocks. And you lose, you lose, you lose. And it's like, well, geez, why am I beating my head against the wall? Is it, is it because when I stop, it's going to feel so good? Am I crazy? Don't answer that. Well, if you've done this for 20 or 30 years and you no longer term it's going to work, then you just say, well, it can suck for quite a long time before it starts working again. And as long as what you're doing is conceptually correct, and this is the hard part, continue to follow along. And again, the stock goes on to make new highs. So, there's always a reason to exit a trade, rarely a reason to, to stay. And, and as I often preach, you always get something good out of Greg. That's why I quote him so much. 
But Greg pointed out that a market only makes a new high 4% of the time. So 96% of the time a market is backing and filling. And if we look back to our biggest winner so far of the year, which is Kim, and I wrote a little formula down here to show that, okay, it's green when things are good, meaning that the stock is making us money, and then it's red when it's backing and filling. So notice there's only these very small periods of time where things are going really well, and the rest of the time it's backing and filling. In fact, if you wanted to make this a dead money report, look at how long or how much time the stock had dead money, so to speak. And then even after it made new highs again, notice how much red you have in here. So it's very hard to follow along, but when you do catch that, and I know I try to make, I, I probably, I've been criticized because I make it sound too elusive, but I want to temper everybody's expectations to realize that, hey, this is tough, and it is hard to catch those few big winners. But once you do, you have to stay with them. And as Sakota said, one big winner pays for them all. Oh, by the way, I skipped the portfolio update just so we'd have time to get to uh, your questions towards the end. It's some more things. The uh, following the portfolio from last February, there wasn't much change because there's only one stock left. In fact, it's just as Kemet in that portfolio. And I'll follow up in the next in coming weeks. I, I feel like I don't have to follow up on that every week for now. I'm ready to kind of move on. But I will continue as long as this Kemet stays open. I will follow up on that, in case you were wondering. Now, some things, as I said earlier, people are saying, well, Dave, you know, you had the sell signal in both of these stocks that stopped out. If we had taken that sell signal, we would have gotten out at a much smaller loss. Why didn't we just take the sell signal? Well, this is a reoccurring question that I have quite often. That's why I put that CNX example in there because that was the same exact thing. Someone had emailed me and said, Dave, we got to actually call me and said, hey, Dave, we got a signal in this. Why aren't we asking? I said, well, I can't tell you to do what you to do what I think you should do because this is um, everything is for educational purposes, right? I can't give you direct advice, but I can educate you on how I'll play the situation and I'm willing to let the stock stop out. Now, keep in mind, from a psychological standpoint, the psychology of something bad happening, like getting stopped out, is not nearly as bad as a missed opportunity. If you think back in your life, as I said, quite as I have said quite often, if you think back in your life, what has a bigger psychological impact on you? Can you think about times when you lost and how that made you feel? Or can you, Ed, can you think about times where you missed a huge opportunity and how that made you feel? I was part of an Internet startup. Okay. I should have made a few million dollars on this Internet startup. But... We didn't sell the company in time. The company was never sold to begin with. And we valued it based on a similar company, which was worth a billion dollars when it came public. I think of that quite often, okay? So the, the missed opportunity has a much bigger psychological impact. Now, it doesn't have to be something that huge. You look at a stock where you made, let's say, 100% on a trade, and you didn't take it, but everything was there, and you should have taken it, you're going to have a pretty big regret on it, and you're going to be more inclined to look at that stock every day. Once I get stopped out of a stock, I'm like, F this, and that's the last I ever look at it. But if I miss a big winner like that, I'm going to be more inclined to pull it up and kind of beat myself up even more on that. So... That's the hard part. When, you, when you're when you accumulating losses, you feel like you got to stop beating your head against the wall and, and you've got to do something. But that's the absolute worst time to start changing the plan and adding in new rules. Now, if you do think you have a new rule, you can't just look at that 
very small microcosm of observations. And thinking fast and slow, they talked about what you see is all there is. And that's a big problem from a behavioral finance standpoint. People just make these small observations and they assume that's how it is, that's how it will be, that's how it ever was. So let's say you have a rule that you're going to exit your long positions if they bow tie down. Well, in the aforementioned example, you or to go back to examples, you would have exited that big winning trade, maybe one of your bigger winners of the year. Or let's say you're going to exit on two weeks of dead money. Well, you would never have stuck it out with the Kim it, the Kim trade. So you could look at your last string of losses and, and you could easily find something that would have prevented those losses. But if you rewind that and go back 5, 10, or even 20 years and see how that rule would have shaken out, there is likely a better than average chance it would have taken you out of your big winners, those elusive outliers, as that word again, elusive. But without those big winners, your performance would be mediocre at best. Now, one thing you have to be careful of, and, and this is something that somebody brought up, they said, well, you know, the indexes have gone higher over the last, what is it, seven, eight years or whatever. They've just kind of mostly gone up. Well, there's been some pretty serious spills in between. When we get to the real chart, we'll take real charts. We'll look at that live charts, I should say. You got to be really careful chasing the market performance, and I know everyone does it. I've been approached by a hedge fund before, and I helped them out, but it just it ended up being a um, what's the, a camel is a is a horse designed by a committee. Just turned it to a camel, and it didn't work out longer term. But he had a totally non-correlated fund. It had nothing to do with the S&P 500, but the S&P 500 was going higher. So he hired me to pick out some patterns for him, some trend patterns, some find some trend stocks, so he could he could start a trend following portion of the portfolio. Well, again, it became a bit of a camel because either you're a trend follower or you're following your other methodology, which is non-correlated. But it's hard to do both because you'll end up with the worst of of both worlds. So you got to be really careful when you're chasing relative performance and uh, you can't eat relative performance and that's something that that Greg says so when the market is down 50 percent if you're only down 40 percent well your relative performance you know you're still a hurt and pops that doesn't do you any good so and I know it's tough and I feel the pressure to it I especially feel the pressure because I have a clientele that's expecting to beat the market otherwise why would you even bother okay well, sometimes the market goes up, and sometimes the market goes up, uh, an index will go up for strange reasons. Like you'll have a sector like commodities that's, that have been beaten up really bad. All of a sudden, they have a big rally. The, the overall market will go up. You'll have a sector that's been really choppy. It'll break out, but it might not follow through and come back in. And at the same time, some other sector might break out and not follow through. So you have this internal kind of turmoil and choppy action but the overall market pushes higher. And if you're down there in the trends, did I just, my Cajun just slipped out. If you're down there, if you're down there in the trenches, then it could be quite difficult and you just kind of have to bide your time waiting for those next big trends to come along. Now, in the end, the stock picker will win. The stock picking trend follower wins, but the buy and hold crowd can look pretty smart for extended periods of time. If you go back to 2009, we started buying 2009 because we had a lot of transitional setups to the upside. But a couple of years later, I, I can't see the chart in my mind, but I have to, I'll have to look. I know in 2016, we had a pretty serious sell-off. We shorted quite heavily then. Maybe it was 2015. There was a pretty serious sell-off. We shorted quite heavily then. So we have played both sides throughout. We focus mostly on the long side, but occasionally when the market begins rolling over, as Greg says, you have to treat all sell signal seriously we have shorted now a couple times it was worth our while to actual short but in, in perfect hindsight without even shorting we probably done just as well or even better over those period of times 
we stopped out. I guess the main thing I should point out is that we did stop out of a lot of longs when the market rolled over on those times. Had we just held on to those longs in perfect hindsight, we might have done much, much, much better. But sometimes the old hedge fund, as the old hedge fund adage says, he who sells, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So you can't get caught up in the fact that the market has just gone mostly higher for the past seven, I guess going on eight years now. And that'll work until it don't. And it just go back to 2008, obviously, late 2007, 2008, where the market lost 50% of its value. Go back to 2000. And if you really have some time on your hand, go back to the early 1900s. And if you really have some time on your hands, go get some rice charts from Japan going back 600 years. Or study the South Sea bubble or Tulip Mania or other bubbles like that. Does either the TKO or first thrust have a criteria where in the trend, the top or bottom of the trend, they occur, i.e. bow ties, highs, low? Absolutely. Um, with all transitional patterns, and I was just making a quiz for this two days ago to, to, that I've just published in the course, with all transitional patterns, you want them – coming off of major highs and major lows, and that's something I often preach. So if you're looking at a shorter market, you want the transitional pattern, whether it's a first thrust, bow tie, or something that looks like that, coming off a major high. And if it's a traditional a transitional buy, emerging trade buy, you want it to come off of a major low. Now, the TKO is a trend resumption type of pattern, so you have a trend in place. Remember these patterns, let me see if I can draw the arrow, or markets rolling over, or markets bottoming out. So it's a transition or an emerging trend, a new trend so to speak. The TKO is a trend resumption type of pattern. So you're looking for that trend to resume after a knockout type of move, something like that. So yeah, this market does have to hit a new high, but remember we're looking to trade with the trend. In this particular case, the market does have to hit a new high, but subsequently rolls over from that high. In this case, a new low subsequently rallies from that low. Now, all other rules that I preach apply to something like a TKO. If you're in a trend, re trend resumption pattern and you've got a bunch of trading up here, and obviously this should be further back, but if you've got a bunch of trading back there, then it should be ignored. Let me see if I can get a new screen in here to draw that in. Let's try a white screen. So if you have a lot of trading like this, and the market does this, and then it comes up and has a TKO type of move, and this is a bona fide, nice established trend, well, you don't take the setup because it has this overhead supply. So ideally, this should be some sort of major, major new high and above any other trading in the past, okay? And the same thing with a transitional pattern. So let's say the market goes sideways for a while, sets up and does this, and then this is the exact example that I, the example looks just like this that I've put in the, uh, in the videos that just went out uh, a couple days ago. So you've got a nice looking setup here, but you're going to cap your gains because you have all this overhead supply. You might cap your gains. Somebody was mad at me once because they, they said every time they don't buy a stock when there's overhead supply, it goes right through the overhead supply. Well, I can guarantee you that every time that will not happen, many times it will hit that, that overhead supply and come back in. So that's where you just have to make a decision and say, well, it might go through that overhead supply, but the odds are stacked against me, so I'm going to avoid the trade. So I think that answers the question. But first thrust bow ties have to come off new highs, and in the case of, but it's the opposite, okay? So a bow tie buy has to come off a new low. A bow tie sell has to come off a new high. A TKO, which is trend resumption, 
buy has to come off of a new high. Okay. All right. And once again, it's here. Trading Full Circle is now available. The base videos where I was kind of surprised when I put together the quizzes for the actual course. The, the base videos that are free don't have quizzes attached and they're not part of learning management system. But once I put the quizzes in, I was amazed at how many important concepts were covered in, that, in those um, base videos. So check it out. Uh, you can use this link right here. And right now, if you just go to my website, there's a, uh, on the home page, if you click on the one that, the, the picture that looks like this, you can get to that page too. Uh, Learning Management System continues its rollout in 2017. I'm not sure exactly what the website's going to morph into. Maybe I need to just take a step back and wait a little while and see how it all shakes out. But the courses are going to be converted over time, and hopefully I'll get another course or two into the learning management system this year. If you purchase any course that you've known me from DaveLander.com, then that course will be free to you in the learning management system. And I'm going to freshen them up, add to them, Increase the graphics to a point of not just gee whiz, but to useful graphics such as the little arrows of the charts and the lines, etc. And then you'll have to look at my ugly mug, unfortunately, in front of the uh, green screen. All right, let's go ahead and hop out to the charts. And if you guys have any questions on anything I've said so far, margin call. How many times do I have to tell you? Every Thursday, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock Eastern. All right. Let's see if I can turn that ringer down. Problem is, I turn my ringer off, and then my wife will call, where were you? Like, right here. <laughs> Never been anywhere, lately at least. All right, let's take a look at the... Uh, the overall market, and there's a couple things I want to flesh out, and then we'll hop. We should have plenty of time today. I planned it so we'd have a little more time to uh, get to the individual stocks because we haven't been, I haven't been keeping up lately. I've uh, been pontificating too much. Let's take a look at the overall market. If I could find it, talk amongst yourselves. All right, let's start with the piece first. Obviously, this open scores as a bummer, but it's important not to freak out too much and let things shake out. Don't freak out. Let them shake out. Hey, I'm going to write that down. Let's take a look at spiders real quick. Spiders get a true open. Now, I'm not a huge fan of day trading, but sometimes when you get these big futures down openings, especially if the overall market is in an uptrend, you can actually look to play that opening gap reversal when that opening range gets taken out. And that's kind of a la Toby Crable. If you go back and, and study some of his stuff, he did a lot of that opening range breakout stuff, especially when you have a gap down like that, the ORB stuff. So sometimes you could actually fire off a little day trade on these opening gap reversals. But so far, so good. It's coming back nicely. We've, we've actually closed the gap for today, which is obviously a good thing. Let's get back to cash. And you can see same sort of action there, too. You don't get a true open, by the way, in the, in the S&P 500 itself, okay? Because not every stock opens at once. So you need to look at the spiders. I mean, I'm sure you guys know that, but sometimes I need to explain why I'm popping out to the spiders. But we've got a little range in here, and it's above the prior range, as you can see so far, so good. Now, one reason, even though the market seems like it's just going up, and if you listen to media, it sounds like it, but you can see there's been some pretty serious spills in here. And that's why it's been a little hard in some cases to catch some good trends. And if you go back to late last year, and I think we were, we were heavily short back here, as we should have been, Certainly short in 2015, okay? Like way back here. Maybe that's what I'm thinking about. 
we were we were pretty heavily short back here. Market had a pretty serious spill, and then even before that spill, saw strong sell off, strong rally, strong sell off. You had a pretty serious sell off here. So the buy and hold crowd has been rewarded quite well, and there's been some pretty ser pretty serious spills in between. And as I often preach, that'll work until it won't, the buy and hold thing. And then just look back to, again, 2009, and you can see the market lost over half of its value. Okay? And even looking at the weekly chart since 2009, you can see there's been some pretty serious, again, spills along the way. And you have to take those signals seriously. And don't beat yourself up if you're not beating the market all of the time. Just make sure that you want to beat the market. Just make sure you're beating the market over time. The overtime might take you a year or two to catch up and beat the market. And I know it's a long that seems like a long time, but after you've been doing it for 20 years or so, then it seems pretty normal. So S&P 500 kind of hanging in there above this little prior range in here, so that's certainly a good thing. NASDAQ Kind of interesting in that we had this, this was the last knockout move. We had a nice rally out, and now we're having a repeat knockout move here. So as I said in the week of charts, I'm sorry, the market in a minute this morning, we want to watch these lows in here. So I'd watch 6,100. Not that that's a line in the sand, but that's a low of the TKO. And as I showed in the prior example, when the TKO did trigger Sometimes, again, that TKO is more than just a, a TKO. It could be a serious knockout start of something bigger. Knockout. It could be the start of a bigger move lower. So I would watch 6,100 in the NASDAQ. And I wouldn't go nuts if it got taken out, maybe even 6,000, okay? And... At the least, it, it should find support somewhere in its prior range. If it doesn't, then we have other problems to deal with. But we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Now, just for s gs let's throw some moving averages in here. And as I preach, and again, I learned this from Greg Morris, when a market crosses below, or I should say closes below, an exponential moving average, that exponential moving average will turn down. So this is a 20-day exponential moving average. And then, again, watch those four base introductory videos. But you can see it closed below the moving average, and the moving average begins to turn down. And here's another close, and notice that it continues to close lower or turn down. Okay. Also notice the 30-day moving average with just one close below it will turn down. Now, it's hard to see. I don't know how far I can zoom in. That's as far as I can go. But if you magnify this, this moving average actually has a slight negative slope to it. Donald is paying me a visit. I don't know if you guys can hear him or not. Hopefully not. So just for S and G's, let's throw that 50 in here and see where we are. Just in case Phil's paying attention. Yeah, you know, what's amazing is all technicals will often come together at the same point. And this is this is a, a, another reason why you don't want to, you know, I just thought I had to use it, every indicator in the world, test every indicator in the world. And I've got bookshelves full of books on technical analysis. But when you boil it all down, you only need one or two. And most of the time, I don't even use any other than the occasion moving average. But what's interesting is a lot of times these technicals will come together. And I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but it's, it's kind of funny. Some people actually have taken technical formulas, I'll just say a stochastic, for instance, and they'll they'll put their name on it and they'll tweak it up just a tiny little bit so they can put their name on it. But it's still stochastic. But anyway, before I digress too far, I'll get myself in trouble, you could see that... The 50-day moving average is right around the level that we should not take out for this market to remain healthier longer term. doesn't mean that that's the end of the world or that's a line in the sand, so to speak. But if we do get below that 50, then we're going to have to pull in our horns a little bit and reevaluate things. 
The big gap on 421, 427 in the Qs and comp, unlike the S&PX, has not filled. The big gap on 421, 421, 421, what are you talking about? 421, this gap? Yeah, well, the gaps, here's the thing with gaps. Don't, you know, there's, that's, a, that's a big misnomer out there that gaps get filled. You know, that's, that's bad technical analysis. It means nothing, okay? So if you read some books on technical analysis, they're going to say that all gaps get filled, okay? So you got this gap way back here. Oh, that gap's going to get filled, okay, meaning that the market's going to come back in and trade through that gap. No. If anything, I use gaps just the opposite. In fact, I, it was kind of funny this morning. I didn't realize it, but uh, I was Googling my own work just to see what was out there uh, while talking about TKOs. I wanted to see what other people were saying. And I actually noticed that in the CMT study guide, it's like a $200 book to study for the chartered market technicians. They were actually – talking about my explosion, in addition to TKOs, they were talking about my explosion gap pivot pattern. And what I said there was that it's a misnomer that all gaps are filled. And actually, if anything, the gap could be a level of support, and you could actually trade off of that gap. So I wouldn't go way back in the market and worry about a gap way back here that it's going to get filled or anything like that. It might, okay? And obviously, if the market sells off, but you can't hang your hat on that, and you can't trade off of that. You can't say, oh, this gap's going to get filled. I'm going to short this market with two fists until that gap gets filled because it might not get filled for 10 years, or it might never get filled, okay? There's gaps go back in time. I'm sure there's gaps from the 1900s that haven't gotten filled yet, <laughs> you know? So I would toss that out, Howard. I wouldn't... Uh, I mean, that's just, you know me, I'm, I have strong personal opinions, but I've been around for a while, and a lot of what I do is empirical. In other words, that's a fancy way of saying it. I just look at charts. Let's take a look at the Russell. Every time the Russell tries to break out, it comes back in. So that's what's Godfather. You know, every time I try to get out, they pull me back in. Um. You can see the Russell's been stuck in this stupid range for a while. And maybe that's why we've been having trouble capture, capturing some uh, big trends in these uh, smaller cap issues. Maybe this is more indicative of what's happening internally. But so far, a little bit of an opening gap reversal. That's kind of textbook, by the way. Let's drill down on that. Take a look at it. It doesn't always work that perfectly where you could just buy a reversal of the first bar, right? But so far it has. And so far that low hasn't gotten taken out. Now, let's not get too obsessed over the micro. Let's keep our eye on the ball here. And you can see the Russell has not made a whole lot of forward progress in quite a while. But in more recent times, it did bang out new highs, all-time highs. And it is a too far from all-time highs. So as I preach, when the market is at or near all-time highs, give it the benefit of the doubt. Now here's something that's kind of interesting. When you look at the sector action, it's like some of these sectors that were going sideways broke out, came right back in, then they broke out again. Okay. So that might explain some of the action in the indices. Like for instance, you know, the energies rallied up real big and then they imploded right back in. So on a day like that, or a couple days like that, combined with some of these other areas that were kind of mediocre at best rallying, That'll actually push the market higher, but it doesn't mean you should be buying these areas just because they're low or whatever. And that's part of the thing I was saying earlier. Sometimes you can have a, a vicious sector rotation internally. Now, before I forget, the argument about the TKOs applies, or pullbacks in this particular case, applies to sectors in general. So we'll keep an eye on these semis and see if this, you had that one TKO bar plus another little follow-through bar here, so let's just call it a pullback, to see if this pullback gets taken out.
I guess it's a two-day TKO. Yeah, no, not really. Uh, it will be in another day. Did, uh, Warden uses rolling charts, which sometimes um, will change things up a little bit as opposed to calendar charts. But I don't want to digress into that. The, the point is that if we take out the recent lows in here, 2,900, again, it's not a line in the sand, but we might want to be a little bit more concerned. Just for SGs, let's throw that 50 in here. I hope Phil's here today. He sure does like that 50. And you can see that it's a little ways below the market. It's going to catch up pretty quick. But still, it's close enough for government work to 2,900. So I wouldn't rush out and sell the semis if they broke 2,900, but I would be a little bit concerned. And again, you might want to pull your horns in. Now, one thing that is, speaking of a little concerning, hardware doesn't look so good. But hardware is mostly Apple. So let's take a look at Apple. It's a busy day in the forum today. You can see Apple kind of came up here, flattened out, broke down pretty hard. And now, as you can see, there's daylight below the 50. The 50 has begun to flatten out. Let's throw the bow ties in here. This is what I call a forced bow tie. When you have a sharp sell-off like this, it forces the bow tie to come together. So it's still a bow tie. I mean, if I'm looking at this, I'd call it a first thrust, first and foremost. It doesn't matter what you call it. It doesn't matter what you call me, as long as you don't call me late for dinner. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm working on that, though. I swear. This time I'm serious. Uh, some areas like the banks, and it's kind of another example I'm trying to make about, hopefully the point's coming out, that you have these areas that look toppy and have been real weak, but then they come flying back up like this. And, again, that will buoy the, the indices because the banks are obviously a mostly big cap area. Drugs, kind of choppy, but they've improved as of late today notwithstanding. Biotech, a little bit stronger. Try to break out just yesterday, today coming back in, but sideways at best, as you can see. So I think your main takeaway today, let's take a look at transports first, and then we'll get back to the main takeaway. Transports so far have broken out, and they're, they're surviving fairly well today. I'm not a huge fan of Dow theory, but I do believe that the more sectors that fit, the more pieces of the puzzle that fit, the better off you are when it comes to the overall market. So in that light, yes, it's good that the transports follow along with the overall market. I'm more of a new economy or old versus old economy guy where I like to see the semis in areas like that, technology in general, rally along with the overall market. But I guess you can't completely throw out the transports as, as not being useful, well, in addition to the main sector, but... Because obviously, with all the mail order going on and everything, it's still indicative of the economy. Years ago, it used to be the rails, I think, with Dow Theory. And the reason was that the railroads were doing well. That means that goods were being moved and goods are being sold and the economy was doing well. So, you know, maybe there's nothing new under the sun except this time the transports are the uh, transports that transport goods and services. I don't guess you transport a service, do you? Goods. All right, let's take a look at bonds and then uh, maybe take a look at the dollar and we'll move on. Bonds are doing very well in here, and that's good because bonds up, rates down, and as long as rates stay low or certainly don't have a big delta, in other words, a big change, I think that the overall market, well, at the least, won't have to worry about interest rates. When interest rates become competition for stocks, then you might see some stocks get sold off. And obviously, we've been in this artificial interest rate environment for a long, long time, and sooner or later that's going to end. But for now, we don't have to worry about it. And you can see that, as a general statement, albeit a choppy one, bonds have been an uptrend. So bonds up, what? Rates down. All right, I think that's enough on the overall market. Just one or two things in here. Uh, health services up near new highs. HMOs within health services or health care plans, whatever you want to call it, banged out new highs in here, um, down a little bit today, but banged out new highs earlier today. So that area hanging in there. So, again, the bottom line is let's just keep an eye on these technology-related areas that have knocked out like the NASDAQ itself. 
and make sure that knockout bar doesn't get taken out. And again, not to beat the dead horse, we're not going to quit when that happens, but we're certainly going to pull in our horns, and we might begin keeping an eye out for a short or two. All right, that's all I have to say about lecturing in the market. Anyone uh, have any stocks you want to talk about or any questions not covered? I'll take a look at the dollar while we wait in your um, questions. The dollar has been headed mostly lower, as you can see. And what's interesting here is if you take a look at commodity-related areas like metals and mining, they've been headed lower too. Okay. Now, if you read your intermarket technical analysis textbook, such as Murphy's uh, intermarket te technical, what's it called? Intermarket technical analysis. They'll he'll explain to you that dollar down, commodities up. Well, why are commodities going down? I don't know. Supply and demand, I suppose. But if the dollar is headed lower, commodities being dollar denominated. All right, Susan. Yeah, I'm glad you asked about that. We'll get to it. Will as a general statement be more expensive, or will be more expensive? So commodity stocks should go up. So here's a case where I think it's interesting that something's up, right? Dollar down, commodities down, something's up. So there's a there's a reason it doesn't matter, but there's a reason why commodities are headed lower in spite of a weak dollar. And I just find that kind of interesting. So study your intermarket technical analysis, but remember it's very hard to trade off of it. You could have negative correlations where they should be positive, such as this case here, okay? Well, this is actually a positive correlation, which should be negative. But you get the idea. And then more importantly, when something is, is blatantly not behaving as it should, I think that it's worth taking note. Now, you don't want to rush out and trade again directly off of it, even if it's not working as it should. But it's something that you want to keep an eye on. All right, Susan wants to talk a little bit about gold. We could do that. Let's take a look at oil first. Oil is banging out new lows in spite of the dollar going lower. Same sort of action there. Commodity should be going higher. Now, what's cool about this is, as I'm looking at this chart, we have the potential of the mother of all bases, the mother of all bottoms, to form. This could be turn into a major Phoenix type of situation where oil is banging out these these all time oil, not all time lows, but all time lows for the ETF at least. These lows way down here. Anybody know where's cash right now? Anybody know what cash oil is? You can just hit Google cash oil. But it's interesting that oil's way down here. Now the good thing is as this oil bottoms out longer term, how many times out to tell you? Margin call. Don't answer it. Now, if this bottoms out, it might take another year or two. It might take another month or two. Who knows? But if this bottoms out nicely in here, we could see the mother of all buying opportunities in energy stocks. Now, I have seen some transitional setups in energies lately, but I've passed simply because energies overall remain a pretty serious downtrend and the underlying commodity remains in a pretty serious downtrend. Now, keep in mind that sometimes you might have a really good looking setup and you think it's worth a shot, even though all the pieces don't fit. And there's nothing wrong with that. But for now, I think we need to hold off on those energy stocks for those aforementioned reasons. Okay. Now, Susan wants to talk about gold. Silver and gold, silver and gold, everything glitters. All right. I guess I shouldn't be too lighthearted. Sometimes I get clients get mad sometimes. You sounded too happy in the weekend charts. We, we we just lost money. Yeah, well, you know, laugh to keep them crying, buddy. Uh, <laughs> it's hard for me to get excited about gold because it's all over the place. It's kind of Jackie Mason lately. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's all over the place. So I wouldn't rush out and buy any gold right now. For me to get excited about gold, what I'd love to see happen 
would be for it to go down and bottom out and it might take a long long time but just just absolutely fall out of bed bottom out and then it might be worth well let's take a look at silver real quick if silver just returns to half of its all-time highs you'll make 60 percent yeah i know if, if my aunt had you know what she'd be my uncle right <laughs> these commercials Anyway, you can see that silver is kind of all over the place, too. Sam says, but Dave, what about the situation in, the, what about the situation in Nigeria? <laughs> uh, people here for the first time are like, what is up with this guy? Dono, I like that. It's on my land list, though. Can't talk about it. GDXJ, if it bow ties, do you buy? I think that's, that's the juniors. GDXJ. Well, in an ideal world, I would like to see the bow tie come off of major, major, major lows, okay? Case in point, look back to 2016. Look at that bow tie, okay? That was the, the mother of all buys, and I'm 90% and I'm sure we bought some gold stocks back then. If we didn't, I need to be kicked in the ass, okay? But you could see that the GDXJ, which, is, which are the juniors, uh, had a nice little bow tie way back then. Ideally, I'd like to see them make some major, major, major lows. So the quick answer to your question is no. Will I buy it? No. Um, at least not just yet. You've got a lot of overhead supply to deal with. It's kind of just meandering around. In an ideal world, again, I'd like to see it come down here, scrape bottom for a while, and then play that transitional type of setup. Uh, Donald, that's on the lander list for today. Well, I think I could talk about that one. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's – I think I did put it on the list for a reason. Let's take a look at it. SQ. Um, yeah, the reason I didn't put it on the list was it needs to be a little bit deeper. I know somebody sent me an email on this one. I have an email. My replies have been really late lately, just FYI. So if you're on the service, put urgent subscriber question. This is a TKO where it actually made a new high the same TKO day. I prefer them to, to be a little bit below the high on that day. Uh, it's just not enough pullback based on the magnitude of the run we've seen in here, okay? So I'd like to see a pullback that looks a little bit more like this, maybe a little closer to 21 or certainly below 22. It's just not enough shakeout for me to get excited about because this stock has had a pretty good run in here. Hey, look at this gap right here. It's going to close the gap. Well, it might someday. Canadian dollar makes me wonder about it. I'm short the Canadian dollar. Um, it's been headed lower. Let me check on it real quick. Silver and gold. I'll be in my head all day. Yeah, I'm short of hourly chart in case you're wondering. Uh, so you think the Canadian dollar, Canadian dollar bow tied down. I can't show you because got, I've got live trades going on here. Uh, Canadian dollar bow tied down. And you think the dollar might be wonder about oil bottoming. The Canadian dollar makes me wonder about oil bottoming. Let me think about that. Well, Canadian stocks are commodity based. I mean, the Canadian dollar often has a lot of uh, commodity aspects to it because of the gold and the, and the resources in Canada. So you're thinking because the Canadian dollar is headed lower that oil might be bottoming? Well, that might, you know, again, in a market technical analysis, uh, it's interesting, but sometimes it can be academic. So, and even Murphy says, and I've said this a thousand times in these presentations, they can have long lead and lag cycles. In other words, a relationship. So uh, if you're identifying something, let me know what you're talking about there. Weekly Canadian dollar. Okay. Um, weekly? Let me take a look at that real quick. Well, even the weekly looks like it's uh, in trouble. I might be just talking my position. What internet? About the internet startup, were you or still are invested in? Uh, what industry? Well, it's in, in uh, financial markets. I have 100,000 shares left over. Um, I'm going to wallpaper my bathroom with it one day. <laughs> Okay, uh, so you're saying the Canadian dollar had a lower? 
Beads at bottom. Oil's at 44.56. Okay, thank you. And then 44.57 OX Texas, Texas Intermediate. Okay. GTT. It's still pretty expensive if you think about it. I mean, at $44 a barrel, that's actually, uh, well, it's not that bad, though. That's actually a good price for a barrel. Um, well, here's a case where Donna wants to know about GTT. It broke out. It had a little bit of follow-through, but it hasn't had much pullback just yet. So based on the nature of its breakout, I like a little bit more pullback. The problem is if you get a little bit more pullback, then it's almost stalled out back to its base. So I prefer in a case like this for it to have cleared its base. And also it's a little wide and loose. You can see it's not really a, a perfect base. I think you could dig around a little bit. Maybe you could find something a little bit better than that. But yeah, put it on your watch list. ACLS. How much is a barrel of beer? Well, that'd be fun to do that, that uh, calculation on that. What's a six pack? Six times 12. 72. What's a gallon one? A lot. <laughs> Depends on a beer, you know, a good beer could be a lot. Uh, this one looks okay. Uh, you've got a little bit acceleration higher, so that's a good thing. It did kind of pull back to this prior little breakout. Usually I have a problem with that, but in this particular case, longer term trend still looks pretty good. Uh, certainly okay. Okay, I definitely may be on that one. How's that? Yeah, it's not bad. And it does trade cleanly, at least in more recent times it's traded cleanly. So good, good eye on that one. You just redeem yourself. ACLS. Yeah, I can use some beer. I always hit a drawdown when I quit drinking. <laughs> Picked the wrong week to stop sniffing glue. CTRL. Yeah, this one's okay. Uh, it's not jumping out at me for some reason. Let's see if we can pick it apart a little bit. It's got some bad memories way back here, but that's a long ways away. Let's not worry about that too much. It's okay. It, it's sort of... It worked its way higher, accelerated higher, it came back in. Um, it's okay. It's, it's just not jumping out at me for some reason, but I can't really fault it. So, and that, that, Does that make any sense? Oh, okay, you're watching for bottoming longer term in oil. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Okay, it might be a while. IAG is going to be a gold stock. I wouldn't go after a gold stock just yet unless you really, really loved it. Um, the problem here is, it's kind of interesting, this one has defied gravity for the most part. It's just kind of wide and loose and all over the place. If you're going to play these transitional patterns, again, you want to play them like down here off of all-time lows or major, major lows. Uh, right now, it would be more trend resumption pattern. So if it's trend resumption, it would have to be out of this base, this big, wide, and loose, fat base that it's in. So I would hold off on that one hour for now. A keg of beer is what? I forget. I don't know what a keg of beer is. I make my own. Of course, I hadn't made much lately. Uh, admittedly, I bought some. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at this one. This one looks pretty good. This looks like something that's probably on my Landry list. Um, yeah, this looks good. I like this. Uh, nice little knockout-ish type of move. Let's take a look at a two-day chart. I'd almost like to see a little bit deeper pullback, though. I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move. You know, there's your gap back here. That may never get filled, right? There's a gap right here. Let's see if there's a gap that never got filled in this one. Aha! No, it got filled, I guess. Let's see. This gap never got filled, did it? Anyway, I don't want to digress too far. But yeah, that looks pretty good. A uh, little bit more knockout move. Put it on your watch list. Maybe if it got down to eight and a half or so, a little more pullback, I should say. Good eye on that one, Donald. SSTI. 
keg is 15.5 gallons. I have a 20-gallon brewer re. Well, let's see how many days we have here. One, two, three, four, five days. Let's put in a five-day moving average. Yeah, that would be a buy if it closed. And because the high was really not set on day one, you can go back to that closing high. Go back a couple. Of, go back last week where we talked a lot about this pattern. So yeah, it would be a, it would actually one pattern was a buy yesterday, and a new pattern if it closes anywhere above fourteen fifty, it would be a buy today. Let's take a look at the volume on that though. A little IPO pattern. Uh, I think that promo code from last week still works if anybody's interested in the IPO stuff. Yeah, it's got good volume. Uh, it's still kind of thin, but it has decent volume in general. So yeah, absolutely, that would be a buy on today's close. And you would already, I guess you'd already be long based on yesterday's close because it did trigger a different pattern. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. So yeah, good eye on that one, Donald. Keep in mind that IPOs are a little bit more, um, well, speculative, but the, the point I'm trying to get to there is uh, you could trade them in a little bit more breakout kind of fashion than you would, than I do like my core methodology, okay? So the core methodology is trend transitions and trend resumptions, and in some cases trend acceleration, or some combination thereof, the IPO is all of those things, but it can also be very early in the process in these pioneer patterns, as I call them, can also be a little bit more of a breakout characteristic. So that's why, in case you're wondering why I would say that's a buy. CTRL. Uh, did we talk about this one? Yeah, I think we did. You got some bad memories way back here. I think we talked about this one. It, it's okay. Um, it's all right. APPN. Um, yeah, this is kind of uh, interesting. If we did the, uh, let's put the five-day thing in there. And again, go back and look at yesterday's. Oh, okay, so it's not... It's, Obviously not triggering on that. Well, I would I would almost treat this one like a secondary signal now. So I would like to see it kind of pull back a little bit more deeply, maybe to about 17, and then go two by days. What do you mean two by days? AAPN. AAPN. Susan, that one's not coming up. AAPN. Apple maybe? CC transitioning short. Well, it could be. Let's take a look at that. Um, yeah, it looks like it could be in trouble, Susan. I can't argue with you on that. Um, I wouldn't rush out and short it just yet, but I hear you. Wait for a bow tie. Um, you kind of would want to see it set up actually somewhere where it actually already pushes into this supply, I'm sorry, support here a little bit. But, uh, yeah, that's I, I hear you on that one. A-P-P-N. -A A-P-P-N. Is that the one you want to look at? Yeah, we just talked about that one. Long wrong so far. Long wrong so far. Long wrong so far. Yeah, but you know, it happens. If they all worked, then uh, everybody would be doing it right. <laughs> we just sit on our boats and relax. All right, any more? Got a quiet bunch today, a fairly quiet bunch. FRPT. FRPT. Well, one thing I'm seeing here is most of this trend was in these two bars here. 
But the good news is it is beginning to bang out some new highs. Now, you do have some bad memories, and they're a long ways away, but still, I think they could be... Uh, you can't completely forget about the fact that you do have some trading back here, fresh pet. That might be a sign of the times, though. Aren't, aren't these... Uh, not that I want to confuse the issue with facts, but is it uh, fresh pet? And then like the little gourmet stuff that you for your dog stuff that you'd like. Man, that looks pretty good. Why am I eating this can of tuna? This looks pretty damn good. <laughs> I don't know why I'm talking about Bill Clinton. Uh, I like that fresh pet food. Um, yeah, you see, you had the breakout, and then it kind of went like this, and then it kind of went like that. You want to see some acceleration and trend here. Obviously, it's it's pushing higher today, but wait to see if it could follow through and then look to play full pullbacks along the way. No, I'm wondering if that's a. I wonder if the, this would be interesting if that would be like some sort of sentiment. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. Could this be kind of some sort of sentiment play, like with the sentiment of the economy is good, people are spending more money on their pets? Okay. If, this, if people will always spend money on their pets, but if the sentiment's really good, then they'll actually feed them this uh, gourmet food, maybe. STM, ominous, bow tie down. STM. Well, I don't, let's see. Well, it's not a bow tie yet, and again, this would be a bit of a forced bow tie based on that recent slide. Not that you don't want to discount it, uh, but it's more of a first thrust. Yeah, you know, here's another case where you had the breakout, but now it's coming back to takeout, breakout, takeout, okay? So a lot of times if a market breaks out of a base, as I preach, and then takes the base out, then it's in trouble. So, yeah, that would be a possible short, especially since it's coming off of either all-time highs or nearly all-time highs. It's thick enough to short. Yeah, it's coming off of all-time highs or, well... All-time high since uh, 2004, 2005. Kind of interesting, huh? Look, it's hitting resistance at that overhead supply. <laughs> but, Dave, that was like 20 years ago. Well, 10 years ago. But markets have very, very long memories. You'd be surprised. But, yeah, if it got below the bottom of this range or neared it a little bit and pulled back, I think it might be worth a shot. Pets, did we talk about that one? Yeah, I want there's something here, uh, pet med. Well, you know, pet med, the, the, your pets are going to need medicines, and I think people will pay. I mean, I'm just amazed that, of course, I, you know, wait till the day comes, but these people will go out and spend $10,000 to save a dog. You know, what's a dog cost? They're free, right? <laughs> Most expensive thing, free boat or free dog, right? Um yeah, I don't know if this would be worked in with that theory. I think that a fresh pet gourmet food company would uh, would be a little bit more more indicative of um, frivolous spending in a good economy. But you know, you don't want to confuse the issue with facts too much. I mean, let's just continue to be technical analysts. You know, hey, look, there's a gap. Um, this looks okay, but it's another case where most of your trend, okay, is from this one gap up and one wide range bar up, okay? So when a market takes off, I like to see it continue to take off as opposed to take off and then, you know, just kind of like a little bit then come right back in. So I think I would avoid this one. I would avoid it based on that. It's not horrible, though. If you squinch it up a little bit, it looks okay. I mean, I hear you. I mean, you could certainly do much worse. I guess a buy would be right around 54 or something. Maybe put a stop. It's pretty volatile. Stop around 44, 45, whatever, somewhere in this gap. But I think I would pass based on the fact that most of this last latest trend was just in this big gap. Your dog heard that. Well, you know, let's see when the time comes what we're going to do, you know. But uh, I, I've kind of got a pack with my wife. It's like, come on, you know. <laughs> Especially if, they, if they're in, if they're in double digits years, if they're 10 years old or older, uh, they're not going to get a replacement hip, you know. I'll, I'll get a uh, – I'll buy a new car before I do that. <laughs> Sorry. 
or I'll put the money in my kid's college fund. I mean, come on, at some point you have to. You know it's going to end badly, George Carlin. When you buy a pet, it's going to end badly. That's the. Um, that's what I always say when uh, when we talk about making a trade. When you make a trade, it's going to end badly. You know that. T T W O. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, nice little knockout type of move. To those of you who who are familiar with some of my older patterns, it's what I call a double top knockout. So yeah, it's not bad at all. Um, now, you could say, well, Dave, isn't that trend just a few bars like you just said? Well, yeah, but notice that it's accelerated higher. It's accelerated higher and then accelerated higher again. And then you had this double top knockout pattern. So I would enter, you know, maybe enter as crazy as it sounds above this high in here. Or, you know, maybe somewhere in between if you'd like. But that would be the actual trigger of the TKO. But ideally, you'd want to see that trigger sooner rather than later as I just discussed. A mat for Peter. Yeah, here's another example of your TKO type of pattern. And then now it's kind of turning into like a trend pivot pullback. Um, and it's a big fat stock, but sometimes these big fat stocks can do okay. And then you could see as a general statement your or more than a general statement, the, the, it's accelerated higher nicely. So, yeah, I think this is a decent-looking setup in here. Um, I wouldn't – I don't think I'd necessarily wait for that – this bar here to get taken out. Maybe enter somewhere in between. But, yeah, it's a pretty good-looking stock. Not a huge fan of trading these these big, huge liquid stocks with that 10 million shares a day. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah, about 10 million shares a day. I don't know why. I sound like Bill Clinton today. UCTT, yeah, that one's been on a tear forever. It's okay, okay? And then, you know, tonight you'll probably see a lot of these stocks in my Landry list. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. I like the, the knockout. I like the depth of it. Uh, great momentum longer term, okay? The only thing scares me a little bit, and I get asked about this quite often, is when is it too late in the trend? Well, technically, it's never too late in the trend, but it has gone up about 350% round numbers, maybe a little bit more from those lows over a fairly short period of time. So one has to wonder how much further does it have to go. But, yeah, as far as being following the system, textbook type of setup, it's it's nearly a textbook type of setup. Um, you know, maybe in around 24 Stop around 19 or so. It's not bad. W. You guys are getting better and better. I can tell you that right now. Um, well, let's see. Uh, it was all over the place for a long time. But keep in mind that personalities of stocks can change. Okay. And now it's banging out new highs. I would put this on your momentum list, but it's not set up just yet. Okay, any more? TTD, I think we did that one already. I'll get the um, recording process as soon as possible, so it'll be up. Bought W and sent you an email. Okay, you don't have to send me an email when you buy something. <laughs> Unless you want to, of course. Yeah, you bought the breakout? I hear you. That's kind of a scary play, though. But, you know, to each his own, if you have a methodology outside of mine, don't let me mess you up. You know, I was talking to a bunch of day traders. I'm like, if you're printing money day trading, then keep day trading. But sooner or later, I think you're going to have to make a turn. Don't let me screw you up. But start thinking a little bit longer term. You know, you don't want to be sitting there like the rat pushing a little button for cocaine. TRVG, Travago. I think it's too many days in the pullback now. Let's take a look at that because that that was on my list for a while. Yeah, Susan, it looks okay. All right, uh, you know, if it took out twenty, maybe I think it might be a buy, but it's really I think it's too many days in the pullback. I can't really fault it too much though. Maybe if I take a three day chart or a two day chart, but now it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. It's twenty something days in the pullback. That's over a month of trading. I hear you, though. I mean, it's had such an incredible run, but I think 
I would pass just based on the number of days of pullback. And that's why it came out of my Landry list. I think if you go back to, let's go back a few days in the Landry list. Let's pick a date. Let's go back to 522. Let's see if I still have it in here. I think I had it way back then. Nope, maybe the next day. Make a liar out of me. Let's try 524. Yeah, there it is. So I, so I had it in way back here. But then I took it off subsequently based on the number of days. So you're you're in the hunt. Um, Donald, that one's on my list, so we won't look at that one. But, yeah. All right, we're right on the cusp of uh, the end of time. Jill says, thanks again for everything you do. I'll be on vacation next two weeks. All right, see you, Joe. So we don't see my good morning. It's not because of you. Can't be heard. It's because I won't be here. All right, well, have fun. Yeah, take a break. One day I'll take a day off. <laughs> I probably should. I read a lot of books that say that I should take some time off. All right. Uh, if I we don't talk between now and then, everyone have a great weekend. Uh, any unanswered questions? David, Dave, Leonard .com. I am a little backed up, so there's a better than average chance that the question might end up in next week's show. But um, feel free to shoot me an email if there's something that uh, needs covering. If it's a quick answer, I could certainly fire it back uh, right away. Uh, if we don't talk to you now and then, everyone have a great weekend. And then again, I uh, hope to see all you guys and girls again next week, except for you, Joe. Have a good vacation. Thank you so much.